biological first aid. You had somebody that you could rely on. Yeah, yeah. somebody who could relate and understand <clears throat> what the heck you've been through. And this beer character used to walk around with a neck brace on because he'd been in an accident sometimes. So I guess when he had to go to court. He was on a levy for Korea. The sergeant major and him and this colonel that I don't know what happened to him but he was a few french fries short of a happy meal would wander around and he would pick up butts and stuff and they kept him on active duty just to make sure he got his 20 years in because his wife had a serious illness so that she could continue getting medical care. Turns around and they write two letters, one for me and one for Marty. Marty died a couple of years ago. He lived in San Antonio. <clears throat> that we were extremely distraught the fact that Major Beer was being shipped to Korea and that it was traumatic to the both of us to the point where we were suicidal. That was sent to DOD. I didn't agree to that letter. And I didn't give a shit if he got shipped to Korea or not. He had his own private practice downtown, and that's what he didn't want to give up. Because he's a major in the Army, and then he gets off <laughs> duty, and then he, he does the psychiatric stuff, and then on Saturdays. Right. It's disgusting. Yeah. And then I run into this other psychologist at Fort Sam, <clears throat> and he kept calling me Harry. I don't give a shit if he was a lieutenant colonel. Didn't make a rat's ass to me. My name was not Harry. My name was Sergeant Ed Mueller. And he got pissed off at me. He was totally out of line. You don't, talk, you don't talk to me like that. And I said, first of all, put on a clean uniform, get the egg stain off your goddamn tie and shine your shoes. And I said, then we'll sit down and talk. So the next time I saw you, him, you earned those stripes. So the next time I saw him, he had a clean uniform on, and his shoes were shined, and, and his hair was sergeant? cut. Did you call your sergeant at Mueller? Yes, he did. Good. And I said, "Screw you! I don't want to talk to you anymore." So I saw a social worker. Now he was cool, hmm. but with the VA now, it's when they opened up the vet centers, they had Vietnam vets. That were psychologists, social workers, and the VA managed to get them out of the way and bring in their talking heads that sit there and go, yeah, I can empathize, I can see where you're coming from. No, you can't, you fuckhead. You ever been in the military? No. Then how the fuck can you sit there and tell me you know where I'm coming from? end of conversation. They put me in in a group. Here you got a bunch of guys with various backgrounds and I'm the only one that was a prisoner of war. I can't relate to these guys. So they send me <clears throat> up the temple. I was driving up there once a week to sit in with former prisoners of war from World War II and Korea. These guys now were crashing because when they came back, they went to work, raised kids, da, 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 da. now they're 60 years old and all that shit's now coming back on top of them. Yeah, and they've been told that nobody could ever possibly understand your stuff, so just keep it to yourself. Yeah. So here I am with a group, <clears throat> you know, figuring out what they did. These guys survived by working. They worked 60 hour weeks, put their lives with their wives, their kids, and put everything in the back. And then when it came time to retire and wind down, it all came back. Yeah. So what do they do? They bring this 
spoon in. I don't have any cook. Who has flashbacks? Never saw combat. Never saw any body bags. But he was a spoon in Vietnam. And put him in with us. And he's relating to, you know, going to the supermarket and seeing meat and having a flashback and having panic attacks. I looked at him. I really got everybody pissed off over this. I said, get the fuck out of here. I said, you ever fire your rifle? Do you ever shoot anybody? Well, no. I said, you don't belong in here. I said, these are all heroes in here, not you. Get the fuck out. You shouldn't talk to him like that. I'll talk to him any way I want. He's a fucking fraud. And you put him in here? He doesn't fit in here. He had not gone through what you and the other guys had gone through by any means. Nope. I sometimes let my mouth run away with me, but it's like, sorry, it's, that's my thought process. You said Simple what you were that. thinking. Hmm? You said what you were thinking. True. So I stopped going up there because it got to be a hassle to drive all the way up the temple then try to find a parking place and then go in for their weekly hashtag. I tried sitting in here at the vet center, but it was the same thing. You had, you had guys from various backgrounds and di different experiences that I, I just couldn't relate to. So I didn't do that. Plus the fact that it kept me drugged. Thorazine, Melaril, you name it. And based on those earlier diagnoses that were incorrect? That was the VA. And finally I just took the pills and just the hell with it. Did you tell them? Yeah, finally I said, I'm not taking your meds anymore. I said, it's not doing me any good. I said, I'm lethargic. I can sit and watch a test burner and all day on the TV and have a great time. And I said, I can't do that. That's not a life. Yeah. No, I got I got very active in a lot of vet stuff. You're too healthy for that. Pardon? You're too healthy for that. I thought so. Yeah. But you know that that homicidal tendency boy. <laughs> well, I'm. That's why I'm on this side of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and you're lucky. My gun's in the other room. <laughs> yeah, I knew the door was open there too. <clears throat> Gas choke wheeze. But, uh, no, coming back was really great. Unfortunately, I didn't want my parents to see me at Patterson Army Hospital. That's Monmouth. Okay. I wanted to be left at Tripler in Hawaii, you know, get a few rays, put a couple of pounds on, because I was pretty skinny. Okay. And now uh, everybody had to, had to go where they had to go. So I ended up seeing the General Bauer, who was Chief of Staff because I made the comment, I was interviewed about the maggots being let go. I said, I felt like I spent five years for nothing. I got a telegram telling me to report to Washington now. So I sit down with General Bauer and I explain to him my thoughts and my feelings. That's the Vietnamese interrogator. Give me your thoughts, your feelings. And I told him, it's caused a big rift in my family. I said, because all I wanted to do 
was to be dropped off up the road with my duffel bag and walk home. That's how I left. That's all I wanted to do. And then the bit with Captain Leonard issued a direct order for these guys to stop cooperating with the enemy, collaborating, excuse me. And they yelled out, fuck you, Leonard. We'll do whatever we want. General Brower brought in the Judge Advocate of the Ame, the head jag. Mm -hmm. Sat there and explained to me that since Leonard was not the senior ranking officer in his cell block, he did not have the authority to issue commands to these other individuals. And of course you had the ability to consult with your own JAG representative at that point when the order came through. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So I looked at. I mean, whether or not he so had I looked the power at this, to issue the order, I mean, it's stand, they're standing orders. You so I looked at this general and General Bauer, and I said, Sir, with all due respect, then I only salute Army officers, and I don't worry about the other branches of service. That's basically what you're telling me. And the JAG officer went, End of conversation. Thank you, Sergeant Etmuller. And he apologized. He, he said, you know, he said, looking back, he said, we should have kept all you guys together. But that, that wasn't his, uh, that wasn't his call. No, he was Jack. No, I'm talking it's about keeping us all together when we came back. Oh, oh okay. <clears throat> that was their justification. Well, I should also listen. When, when you say, leave me in Hawaii, I want to get some sun, I want to sure. eat some sushi or whatever. Well, I wanted to get laid in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't supply that on the C-141. One either. of the pilots, see, there's some people who were released before we were. Because we could hear the one, the International Control Commission came in on 130s. We could hear them. And then we'd hear the 141s come in. And then they did whatever they did and they would take off. Well, apparently, when they got to the air base in the Philippines and the big hospital, one of these guys took off and they couldn't find him for four days. <laughs> <laughs> he went downtown and was having a ball and they were worried about BD and... Uh, <laughs> So they locked the hospital up. There were guards at all. We, we couldn't get out. We had no civilian clothes either. We were walking around in bad the uh, hospital hospital stuff and then the hospital gowns and everything. They <laughs> they weren't going to lose you. No, no, that would have been a major embarrassment. That's true. But figure the Air Force had to screw everything up for us. There could have been a Navy pilot. I don't know. But it was, <laughs> but it was a pilot. Terrible. One of the airmen and his wife I got to talk to, she had my bracelet. And I hadn't spoken to a woman in a long time. And I completely ignored him. Gorgeous woman. And he realized that he just got up and walked away. And I just sat there and, <laughs> I just sat there and just, blah, 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 you know, yeah. for about an hour or so. And, uh, I would write to them, and they would write back to me, and then lost contact. I don't know if he stayed in or not, mm. but they were they were stationed at Clark Air Force Base. Mm. But uh, yes, there were a lot of funny moments. Do you remember any of the other funny moments? Oh, let's see. Ah, uh, yes, we had a rat come in our room. And we tried to catch it. Okay. And it managed to get 
up between the bars and there were old wooden shutters that they had nailed shut. But sometimes you could, if you looked real hard, you could kind of see out. Well, the rat got caught and we ended up skinning its tail and it looked like a little windsock that you see at the airport. Mm -hmm. And we had it. Like I said, we had a communication system going. Yeah. And the helicopter pilots were talking about, damn, we could use a piece of ass. So we sent them the tail. <laughs> <laughs> I said, boy, this is all we got left. Yeah. All we have is a rat's ass. Yeah. <laughs> so they said, well, we decided to eat it. They didn't, but you know, we sent, sent them a piece of ass or a piece of tail. The other time was they had a bunch of women working up on the train trestle and uh, we were brought out and taken around to this other shed that had these concrete uh, tubs made and they actually had running water. So you go in there and clean your body. Lye soap used to just eat the shit out of your skin. So these gals were up there working on the railroad, ties and the, whatever they're doing. And they looked down and I waved. They <laughs> waved back. So you guys are stark naked because we did you fast. No, 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 no. You, Vietnamese didn't want to see you naked and they definitely didn't want to open up your shit bucket to see what was in there. That, um, that was too taboos. Uh -huh. You changed inside. We don't want to, we don't want to see your naked bodies. <clears throat> okay. That's fine. So I waved, and they waved back, <clears throat> and they started talking. I wanted to know if we were married, and I said, you know, no, no wife. Mm -hmm. I spoke a little Vietnamese. And, uh, and the one came forward like, <laughs> I'll go with you. <laughs> the guard had a shit fit. Jesus <laughs> Christ Almighty. No talk. No talk to them. And I'm... <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> the uh, Burmese family that's up the street, refugees, the one woman asked me, she said, did you have a girlfriend in Vietnam? I said, yeah. I had one in Korea, too. <laughs> and she looked at me and just laughed. It's just it's the way it was. Something to do. But, uh, and you made it home. And made it home, yep. The interesting thing is the State Department segregated us from the Filipinos and the two Germans. Like with some secret mission or something. It's like the two Filipinos were young boys and fought against the Japanese during World War II. And on the trail, picked out and said, that you can steep in water and make tea, don't eat that, don't touch that, you can eat that. Hmm. So they were good to have around. But they, se they separated us. <clears throat> Marjorie Nelson and Sandra Johnson Marjorie Nelson had Nelson come. Nelson was the doctor who wouldn't treat Mar the military. Wouldn't treat the military. She came down from Quang Tri to visit her friend Sandra Johnson. Now, is she an American? I mean, they, they were both Americans. Okay. They both were Society of Friends Quakers. Okay. She refused to treat our wounds. She had a bag. She had penicillin. She had all kinds of stuff. They let her pack her stuff and told her that the city was going to be bombed to get them away to safety. I run across a website a couple of years ago where she may have written a book or maybe she hasn't, I don't know, about being captured 
by the North Vietnamese. And I'm saying, captured. She was let go. And talking about how bloody her feet were. She had shoes. How long was she kept? A few weeks or something? Probably, no. Maybe a month or so. Okay. Because on the trail, she had her shoes tied in a knot over her shoulder, and she walked barefooted. Oh. It was a it was a happy journey to her. Hey, we're we're out hiking. Da -da -da. Did she ever give any rationale for not treating you? Yeah. So. We're, we were napalm and killing kids. We're against war. Okay. Well, why are you over here? Now, did she treat any NVA wounded? No, she treated the American civilians, okay. but not the military. Okay. John Anderson had caught a piece of fragment that was touching his diaphragm. He had the hiccups all the time. Now the interesting thing is, we took off on the trail, John was wounded with the big hiccup thing, and so was uh, a couple of PA and E guys. They got to the portholes before we did because they kept us going around and around and around and around in circles until we got into North Vietnam and into what we called the area was the VIN was the area V-I-N-H VIN mm -hmm. they opened him up took that piece of shrapnel out and tried to make him write a statement that he got shot by an American. <laughs> and then Dale Dye, for years, the rumor was going around that he found Tom Young's body alongside the road. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible. He found Steve Straub. Tom Young was killed behind a building and between the building and the wall. Mm -hmm. That's where they found him. Mm -hmm. Steve Straub was tied up and shot. It took me Christ over 30 years for DOD to finally list him as being POW, died in captivity. Otherwise they were MIA? No, just KIA. Okay. His daddy flew 30 or 40 missions over Germany during World War II. His daddy was a, was an Army Air Corps pilot, bomber pilot. He's lucky he came home. Nah, uh, Straub should have come home. Any idea why they did that? He had a first cat patch. Okay. And first cat brought smoke on Charlie's ass, believe me. So because of his insignia, they were you're not gonna you're not gonna get up north. Plus the fact he started to stagger. He had an open fracture here. Oh, this is the, the, the man who was shot in the arm. Okay. And I tried to grab him. And just as I reached up to keep him from falling is when they shot him. From, from that machine gun position. The one that I wanted to take out. Right. That P. Bernardo wanted And I knew I could have taken it out easy because they were looking down the road and they didn't see me over here. 
and I had a direct bead on him. And Dee Bernard says, don't shoot him. And I didn't shoot him, and I didn't shoot them. But the more I think about it, I regret the fact that I didn't shoot him. I really do. He put all the blame for all the deficiencies of the detachment when we came back, put it all on John P. Novak, who was the first SEAL that we had. Now, John Novak was a Marine, had worked his way through enlisted, warrant, and at the age of 38, graduated a couple of percentage points below honor graduate at the age of 38, Marine OCS. He was a mud Marine. He had seen combat, and he ended up in charge. The man let the enlisted and the NCOs do what they had to do, but he was in charge. Simple as that. Is he still alive? No, he passed away a few years ago, but every November 10th, which is my birthday, he would call me and wish me a happy birthday, and I gave him a Semper Fi. That's nice. And that pennant that hangs at Dinfos now, mm -hmm. he had made, mm -hmm. and it flew outside our detachment. But when he rotated back to the States, he wanted it, it was his, and he took it with him. And then some years ago, me and my boys took off to go see the family up in New Jersey. We stopped off to see him, and uh, that's when he gave that banner to my oldest son. He said, this is a historical piece of memorabilia. And my son said, I don't know what to do with it. I do. So I kept it. And every Veterans Day parade, I would drive my truck and I would hook that onto a, and I would fly it on the back of my truck going up Congress Avenue. And then when we got nominated for the uh, Public Affairs Hall of Fame, I donated that, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, my Ho Chi Minh sandals. So they're in the museum now? It's on the wall of uh, Dinfos, which is now at uh, Fort Meade. But initially, <clears throat> it was hanging in the Pentagon. Well, your original MOS was broadcast engineer. Have, they, have you done anything with the engineers? I would 26 think Tango. 26 Tango. So is there an... And 32C and 26L. Okay. Microwave, fixed station transmitter, and television broadcast. There was 130-some pieces of equipment involved in doing what we had to do. No, I uh, kind of got turned off the Signal Corps when I came back. I ended up in the Medical Corps. And then went to school, got an associate's degree in electronics technology, and then ended up working for a company in the Dallas area, working on the next, excuse me, oh gas, uh, next generation night vision equipment. Hmm. So I did uh, mil spec testing and also a little bit of design on that. Mm -hmm. But then it was an eight to five job and I just, didn't like being pigeonholed, so I said, fuck it. I uh, had a nursing license, and I went back and worked part-time as a nurse. I worked the hours I wanted to work, and I worked the days I wanted to work, mm -hmm. and I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. But to sit there and say, you have to be here, eh, fuck you, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I've been told what to do most of my life, and I don't want to be told what to do anymore. I got a nice t-shirt, says dysfunctional veteran. 
<laughs> Don't fuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> I wear that sometimes. <clears throat> but uh, the Signal Corps didn't reach out to you or try and treat they you did. Right? They did. They offered, they said I could spend the next year and a half sitting in all the classes doing whatever I wanted. But I don't know. I just, I just had really bad feelings. That's all. I was 28 years old when I came home. I'm glad they reached out to you anyhow. Well, I was 28. Yeah. I was too old to go to pilot helicopter school, which I wanted to do. Mm. Then I said, how about language school? Well, your language, I said, I was 18, 28. I picked up words, phrases. I could learn a language. Nope, can't do that either. How about a fight? Nope, can't do that. How about, oh, too old for that. How about, and we went down the list, and I said, how about a medic? Okay, you can do that. Excuse me, gentlemen. Well, my other question is, is there some question that I haven't asked? Something that you think that I, we should know that if left out would cause this theory to be incomplete? Nope. Well, one thing, I have a hard time with people getting real close to me. Mm -hmm. I did. Are you talking about physically or emotionally? Emotionally. Okay. It's, uh, well, when you're close with people, and end up in dire straits like we were, and actually see them get killed, uh, and then being totally hopeless as far as ability to do something. It's rather debilitating. And when I went to work for H.P. Zachary in Corpus Christi, we had an incident with a drag line operator The crane tipped over, he got his hand caught, and he drowned in five feet of water. Yeah. It was a side job, because Zachary was building <clears throat> a cat cracker to make unloaded fuel. I got one more question. I didn't do it. Are you hungry? Yeah, why not? Depends on what you guys want to eat. Well, someplace, someplace good. You know the neighborhood. We don't know uh, Manor, Texas. I was able it's to get. It's Manor. Don't do that to me. Yeah. I've been practicing all day long. Say yes, Manor. It's, it's Manor, and you went through Elgin. It's I not, did call it Elgin. It's not Elgin. Elgin. It's Elgin. Elgin. It I is. found out the word Buda is Italian. <laughs> I thought somebody had cut off Buddha and did put. No, it's, it's Buda? B-U-D-A is Buda? Buda? Yeah. I thought it was Buddha. And the reason why I figured that out was I'm reading a Clive Cluster no novel, and uh, it was one of his characters that does sneaky peek uh, OSS stuff, and they had landed in Sicily to set things up for the invasion of Sicily, right. and it was these Fisherman, the family, B-U-D-A, Buda. Oh. And I said, ah, it's Italian. I don't know what you want to eat. Well, I think you ought to tell us what you like, and then we will go bigger. There's not much that I don't eat, <laughs> to be honest with you. It just depends on, on what, what you guys are in for. You want some Vietnamese food? Well, I'll do the Vietnamese. Sure. It's a little ways from here. Well, we're not walking. Who's driving? We got room? Uh, I'm... What are you driving? I'm driving a pickup truck with one seat in the front. Uh, a regular pickup? A regular pickup. Not a four-door? Not a four-door. God damn it, you're in Texas? <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you, Bob? I know. 
Well, we can we can do it. We'll be uh, we'll be able to fight. I'm no, we'll, we'll we'll take my truck. And you, we'll, is yours a four door? Yes, it is. All right. All right. Okay. So I like a plan. Sure. You put this stuff on right. it. Oh. Thank you, Harry. And I will put this on the internet. You like my tripod? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? You know, I had to look.